After the EPIC European REACH regulation in 2007, the already EPIC PFAS restriction proposal caused another regulatory ripple in the European corporate community. On February 7, 2023, details of this proposal for an EU-wide PFAS restriction to manufacture, place on the market and use of PFAS was presented. As always, the devil is in the detail, so I'm happy to be able to discuss this PFAS restriction proposal with two PFAS professionals. From Brussels, Meglena Mihova from EPA, and from the Dutch authority, Richard Luit, head of Rio Reach at the Dutch National Institute for Public Health and Environment. Welcome. Richard, the Netherlands, together with Denmark, Germany, Sweden and Norway, prepared and submitted the PFAS restriction proposal. Can you provide an outline of the proposal and describe the process leading up to the proposal? We propose a ban on the manufacture, import, placing on the market and use of PFAS. PFAS is a group restriction. Uh, we use, uh, as a group restriction, we use the OCD 2021 definition of PFAS. And they have as a common feature that they are very persistent and have also um, other properties such as uh, their uh, bioaccumulation potential, uh, their mobility, uh, endocrine disrupting activities and ecotoxicity and toxicity. Uh, we uh, know that uh, these uh, PFAS uh, end up in the environment, they are in the water, they are in the soil, in the blood of humans, uh, so they are in ecosystems as well. And they pose an unacceptable risk to uh, human health and the environment. And on that basis we propose this restriction. And the process um, started actually in 2019 when the Council in Europe asked the European Commission to propose a PFAS action plan that was later taken up in the Chemical Strategy on Sustainability in 2020. And around that time also uh, five cooperating uh, countries in the EU commissioned themselves at a political level to work on the REACH so-called Annex 15 dossier. And that's the work we've done. Uh, the past three years. We started collecting data, so reaching out to stakeholders with call for evidence and consultations. We worked on uh, collecting information. The basis was actually in the REACH registration dossiers, but we needed much more. We've written the dossier, submitted the dossier finally by January this year, on January this year. And we had a press briefing on the 7th of February, and after that it was released uh, to the public. And now, we uh, go to phase two, which is the scientific opinion development. If we look at the next steps and deadlines for the authorities, uh, can you clarify that? The original submission was planned for summer uh, last year and it was uh, the, the extended for half a year uh, because the dossier was so complex and we needed much more time to evaluate the information we got from all the uh, uh, consultations. Uh, so uh, it took us half, half a year longer to submit the dossier in the end in January. Uh, and now uh, what will happen next is that the scientific committees at ECHA will uh, look at the proposal. It was uh, submitted to them and they have to decide first on conformity. Uh, last week we presented the dossier in ECHA uh, at the Socioeconomic Analysis Committee and the next step this week will be that it's presented in the Risk Assessment Committee as well. After that we expect to be in conformity and then the uh, so-called uh, public consultation on the uh, Annex 15 dossier will start. Uh, that runs for six months until September this year. Um, and uh, I think that is very important. It's a reaching out again to get more information on the uses, more information on the volumes, on alternatives. And another important uh, point to mention is that on the 5th of April there will be an information session uh, organized by the European Chemicals Agency. So basically the first deadline for uh, RAC and SEAC is September. Um, no, uh, the Risk Assessment Committee in the SEAC will uh, take about a year from now. So somewhere in 2024, we don't know exactly when, they will finalize their opinion. So that will take them a few meetings. Huh? They meet four times a year normally and they will have to go through the whole dossier step by step. It takes them uh, until um, uh, 2024 to arrive at their final opinions. In the final stages of the opinion development, there will be another consultation on the draft opinion of the SEAC opinion. Uh, again, the public will have their say on that, and then uh, it will be finalized and sent to the Commission as a package. So 
our dossier as a, as a so-called background document, together with the opinions, will be sent by ECHA to the Commission, and then the decision-making phase starts, which is actually phase three then, and the Commission is at, uh, uh, well, the initiative is at the Commission to propose, uh, uh, to make a legal proposal for the implementation of the uh, restriction. Uh, and that is, of course, due to happen somewhere in 2025 or 2026, we're not sure. That the decision will be made? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Magdalena, for industry, eh, this PFAS regulation eh, is in Europe, but there's many more PFAS regulations outside Europe. Can you sketch some other PFAS restriction developments around the globe? Sure. Actually, the EU proposal was a major earthquake for, for industry internationally, not only in Europe. However, the PFAS issue is not a new one. We have already two international conventions, and because of the implementation of those, you can see actually developments in many of the Asian countries, also uh, New Zealand, Australia, and also in the US. Now, the scope of those developments is very different from what the EU is proposing uh, in terms of substances that are covered. And we know that in the EU scope, we're talking about 10,000 of PFAS. The difference in what is really misleading and difficult for industry to grasp is that uh, actually the, the, the obligations are very different. In US, for example, US EPA is uh, introducing an action plan for very uh, concrete uh, actions to mainly evaluate and prioritize uh, PFAS and different PFAS groups. But in the same time, in the states uh, in US, uh, there are also state-level developments some of them leading to some restrictive uh, initiatives, but others, and mainly um, in the US, the focus is on reporting and tracing. Well, in Europe, it's, we are talking about uh, market access and pure ban, unless derogations are granted. Okay. Hey, since it is a global challenge for industry, would you also recommend a global approach for them? Well, a global approach will be absolutely needed simply because companies are operating on international markets. So in very um, uh, situations, actually, you do produce a product which is not specifically marketed uh, for the European market. And it's very difficult, especially when it comes to sophisticated equipment, to produce different uh, options for the different markets. But I would say it's important for industry to see what is the common denominator and probably to <coughs> go beyond and check in the supply chain where the PFAS are supplied and used in the production uh, and their incorporation into the final product. But most importantly, and here probably the call to the um, institutions and the authorities is to probably work on the harmonized definition and scope because PFAS and persistency should be perceived in the same way in Europe and uh, US and Asia. Okay, thank you. Hey, PFAS chemicals are used in many products, uh, even those that we don't even expect that uh, they are in. How could companies identify PFAS in their value chain? This is the main challenge, and it starts with the definition, especially that we have also in the European definition some exempted uh, groups of chemicals. And the other challenge is that the supply chains and uh, the actors, they're not necessarily informed about the uh, scope of the restriction in the EU. So they do not necessarily understand the obligations, especially that as we discussed earlier, they have to face reporting obligations elsewhere. So it starts first with educating your suppliers and explaining what are the obligations <coughs> and what is actually that the EU uh, PFAS restriction is focusing on. Yes, I recognize this, of course. This, is, this has been the biggest challenge for us as well. We, we started off with the registration dossiers on the REACH, and in, in those dossiers you can't find a lot of details on the actual use of PFAS. It's, it's, in, it's down the supply chain where you need to go. And especially f in those supply chains where, the, where we talk about long or broad supply chains, uh, on, uh, especially for complex articles, uh, where the PFAS may be in, uh, in, in detailed uh, yeah, yeah, small appliances. Um, and uh, I, th I think we've got a lot of information. We know now that PFAS is almost everywhere, 
uh, in many applications, but uh, we're not, you know, we don't know everything yet, so that's also why we reach out again to get more information. REITs had the slogan, no data, no market. Uh, for the PFAS uh, <coughs> proposal, my slogan would be, no information, no derogation, which, Magdalena, <laughs> thank you for that, you put nicely on your uh, T-shirt. <laughs> Um, we can basically identify three categories, eh? those without information and evidence, uh, where uh, manufacture and use are no longer allowed uh, 18 months after entry into force. Then we have the limo land chemicals, eh? currently insufficient information uh, to warrant derogation, but if in the consultation phase they come up with that, eh? they might maybe uh, uh, cross the abyss. Um, and then we have the uh, TINA chemicals, which stands for there is no alternative yet with sufficiently strong evidence for now. Richard, can you explain why certain derogations are already proposed? Like I, I explained before, the, by default the restriction applies to all users uh, after 18 months. That means that users are banned uh, uh, after that period. Uh, so that also applies to those users which we are not yet aware of. But uh, during the consultations we, we've done, we uh, received information on um, alternatives, the implementation of alternatives, and we discovered that for certain users uh, there were very clear uh, indications that it was difficult to transition to alternatives within that 18 month period. Uh, and for those users we defined uh, certain transitional periods on top of the 18 months. So it's uh, based, it's primarily based on the analysis of alternatives and the difficulty to substitute. So the substitution potential was a key driver for that. And we derived uh, two transitional periods, so five years and a 12 year period. And the five year was based on, defined based on uh, uh, information that was sufficiently clear that uh, alternatives were are already available in the EU, but needed further development or were not available in sufficient quantities. And the 12 years uh, we uh, ex uh, transitional period we use for those cases where it's sufficiently clear evidence that there are no alternatives yet, that the R&D time needed is uh, very lengthy still, and there's also legal obligations, for instance, certification schemes, et cetera, that uh, prohibit, uh, uh, well, actually limit the, the earlier transition to alternatives. So and that is what we use as a, uh, as a set of descriptors to come to the uh, uh, standard transitional periods. And then we also, in addition, we have a series uh, of uses a very limited series of uses for which we describe time unlimited derogations and that is for those users uh, which we know uh, that uh, they are already regulated within other uh, regulatory frameworks such as active ingredients in uh, biocides, plant protection products and medical, uh, medical uh, applications. Um, and uh, uh, some uses such as uh, uh, analytical reference materials. I think so. those are just a few examples um, of the time unlimited derogation we define. Hey, Magdalena, you have an extensive experience with the microplastic restriction process. Um, what could be a good approach for those PFAS currently in limbo land eh, to pull them across this abyss into the derogation zone? Well, the restriction proposal of microplastic was the first big catch-all restriction and uh, talking about derogation and the approach there, I would say the PFAS proposal is suggesting uh, more opportunities for industry, also exactly with the derogations that are identified as uh, warranted, but where information is still needed. So I think that in the microplastic proposal, we didn't have that luxury situation for industry to come late and submit data, late because of the call for evidences and the opportunity given by the authorities uh, already. But here, I think that the, there is an open invitation to come even late with some homework and some information, especially around the alternatives. And this is uh, absolutely critical. I also don't believe that the, the derogations, as they suggested, they will stay as they are because the uh, very straightforward approach to five and 12 years plus the 18 months cannot necessarily fit to all different applications. And then we're talking about thousands of chemicals in many, many uh, various applications. Some of them 
would need faster transition uh, or would be able to actually transition faster compared to others where the reliability requirements or the design cycles would be much more complex. But the authorities uh, have opened the door for, for this interaction and the consultation will be an ideal period. We have seen with the microplastic proposal, however, industry took quite some time, even more than a year and a half, two years, to discover where microplastics are present. I uh, suspect that it will be very much the case here. And here we are running a marathon, but we have also very tough uh, deadlines. So for industry to see what could happen and how actually derogations could be granted, it's very much obviously referring to the microplastic proposal coming even late in the process with quality data that will change obviously the parameters of discussion. Yeah, but that goes back to your t-shirt, no information, no derogation, so they have to act now, basically. That summarizes uh, very nicely, and that was your idea, obviously, but that summarizes very nicely the situation. Yeah. I think that uh, we're talking about a more co-creative approach, where the authorities cannot always know and guess where the chemicals are, but there is a very um, rational approach to the derogations that could be granted. And the fact that the information that was already submitted during the call for evidence now result not only into proposals for derogations, but also candidate derogations, is a sign that when data is submitted, and data means not position paper, but actually quality uh, argumentation and uh, justified explanation about the time that is needed, it is taken into account. You can make the difference. Yeah. Hey, for those companies without the information, eh, uh, so they're basically trapped between the devil and the deep blue sea, are there any derogation prospects or is it game over? It depends on the context. So those uh, applications where derogation is not submitted, it is also or could be that uh, industry did not participate. But in some cases, it is due to the complexity of the proposal or probably the lack of awareness that uh, the consultations pro uh, were already running prior to the proposal submission. So some industries, they still have the wake-up call to catch up and then do a sprint, not a marathon, and submit data. Um, probably that could lead to some additional derogations. It is not uh, only the case of companies that could not provide quality data. Uh, also, uh, the, in some cases, alternatives have been shown to exist. Now, um, probably alternatives could be a viable option for certain applications, not for all. So we may also expect during that process that those uh, industries who cannot actually uh, apply the suggested alternative to their own application could come with data and analysis of alternatives from their point of view and explain that viable alternatives do not yet exist. So options are still out there depending on the case. And if they have information. Absolutely. Hey, the default of the restriction is a ban after 18 months, eh, uh, after entry into force. This 18 months for REIT uh, restriction was basically to allow selling out of uh, current stocks. In practice, this might mean that some companies increase their stockpile. And what to do with products and articles that will be recycled or reused, uh, Richard? Yes, uh, the, the, the 18 month uh, period, which we also call the selling out period or transi standardized transi transitional period, we see much more often in restrictions. Um, I, I'm not afraid of this stockpiling. Uh, of course, some stockpiling could happen, but I think within supply chains, the demand is normally not expected to all of a sudden increase. And I think also stockpiling is a risk because it's a business risk because it, it costs money. It's, uh, uh, it depends on uh, the contracts you have with clients, etc. But and anyhow, uh, the stockpiled amounts of PFAS containing goods, uh, materials, uh, mixtures, etc., would have to be sold after within the 18 month uh, period. Uh, okay, and, if we, and, and, and if we look into the uh, recycle, recycle and reuse, I mean, uh, yeah. a mobile phone, there's a lot of PFAS, uh, mm -hmm. not a lot, but there is PFAS in yeah. a mobile phone. Eh? Uh, uh, fortunately, a lot of phones are currently reused, recycled. Um, how to handle this? Well, in reuse, I think second-hand is normally exempted from uh, restrictions. I, 
I, I think also in this case, uh, second hand, so the reuse of, an, of a phone, uh, refurbishing, etc., is not part. Phone. Yeah, well, that is, of course, that, that is reuse still uh, when we talk about, and I think that's not part of the restriction if we look at recycling. Uh, then it's very clear that uh, recycling means that uh, substances, mixtures or articles within the union are, are uh, uh, placed on the market again. Um, uh, they, they actually call that uh, recycling. Uh, when recycling happens, we have certain concentration limits and f in our proposal concentration limits that are applied to virgin materials also apply to uh, recycled materials. Hey, the derogations are mainly based on the availability of alternatives. Why were essential use or socio-economic impacts not really considered? Um, essential use was not considered because it's not in the current uh, REACH regulatory framework. We propose this restriction on the REACH 1.0, so the, the current REACH regulation. Uh, so there's no legal basis yet to, to work on the essential use concept, use the essential use concept. Uh, of course we considered it and we in, in, the, in the very beginning three years ago because uh, we knew also in the PFAS uh, action plan of the commission it was mentioned. Um, and we, uh, we also as an institute we did some scientific work on that, still running that, very interesting work uh, to, 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 to scope it, to also have a, a kind of a scientific basis on the concept and the perceptions of the public on the essential use concept. Uh, that scientific work is still running and we're of course, as you all know, waiting for the proposal of the commission somewhere this year um, on, on the revision of REACH and also on the essential use. Uh, but we did this, we, we made this proposal within the current legal setting using the guidances, uh, the scientific methodologies that were available to us uh, that are used by the scientific committees ECA, uh, of ECA as well. And uh, that allowed us actually to do this work in, in, in a way that was very familiar to us and also known uh, from other REACH restriction dossiers in the past. So it's in, in, in that sense, this dossier is not that different from other restriction dossiers, but it's, but it's very broad. It's the broadest one okay. and it's the largest one in chemical scope as well. And could it then be that if the REACH revision um, comes into force, that essential use will also be part of this uh, restriction in the end? Um, that, that, that's to be seen. I don't think so. I, I think uh, what will happen is that we will have a decision making on this restriction uh, but that's of course also crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen, but I think the decision making is going to be uh, somewhere in 2025 or 2026 and uh, it will be on the proposal as done within the framework of REACH uh, as is right now the legal basis. Okay. Hey Meglena, uh, we discussed socio-economic briefly. Eh? Um, why was that not so much considered and uh, when is an alternative then an alternative? Well, and probably elaborating a little bit on the essentiality as well, because it also links to the socioeconomic uh, aspects. Uh, although there is no clear-cut proposal on the table, the, that uh, actually concept is not new. Uh, it exists and this, it is practiced already under, for example, the biocidal product regulation where derogations are granted. Uh, and uh, actually, the, the approach so far is very much related to whether or not alternatives exist. So industry should not expect that even we, if we have clear-cut essential use uh, concept definition and it is on the table, that suddenly the entire sector will be derogated. I think that in a way the proposal is a good example of that approach of actually targeting, for example, even medical devices could be derogated for 12 years in the proposal or actually with a question mark that derogation may be warranted but for the information is needed. And this is where the approach becomes quite um, rational, so that the objective is to push substitution and to uh, derogate the essential use, but where the substance is critical for the product and the criticality is not necessarily solely linked to the sector. So um, the socioeconomic aspect will come and inform further because the, um, obviously the importance to society or the safety aspects, uh, that contribution can be quantitatively assessed as well. And I would say probably the proposal was not that based on socioeconomic considerations because of the data that was not necessarily submitted 
in a great level of detail. Again, when we're talking about establishing the proportionality, uh, the authorities are looking into the delta, so not what it is the turnover, the sales, the importance of the market today, but what would be the most realistic scenario if the proposal would come and um, actually no derogations will be granted. And this is where the uh, industry will have to have a very credible case what would be the realistic business scenario and quantify from there. I guess that very few industries manage to realize that and to perform thorough analysis, uh, also applying the methodologies of, uh, that they could develop on, around socioeconomic analysis. Okay, thank you. As already stated in the beginning, the devil is in the detail. Let's start with Article 68 by REACH, um, that requires authorities to demonstrate an unacceptable risk by considering both hazard <coughs> and exposure. The PFASs in scope are categorized as very persistent. Um, are they therefore automatically hazardous? Um, yes, we, we argue that they are very persistent, so the, the group as a whole but they also have other common features, like I mentioned, they, uh, some PFAS within the scope have very high bioaccumulation potential, so they build up in the environment. Some are very mobile in the environment, so they end up everywhere. Uh, so we have ecotoxicity and toxic effects uh, of which the knowledge uh, is increasing day by day, so the scientific knowledge on that, uh, specifically for certain groups within PFAS domain, is very high. Uh, and then we have uh, the, uh, the, the other aspects such as uh, the long-range transport. So uh, all in all we see also that the concentrations in the environment build up, are progressively increasing and uh, we see already that there are uh, adverse effects to human health in the environment and we, uh, we also argue that uh, ad further adverse effects of human health in the environment are inevitable because of these increasing concentrations. That's the reason why we propose uh, this plan uh, yeah. on, uh, on to, to actually reduce the emissions because that's the basis. The environmental releases of PFAS during the life cycle stages, which, which is actually production, uh, but also the surface life of long life articles and the waste stage, uh, which is very, very hard to quantify by the way. <coughs> but they all add up to the environmental releases and also the buildup of these concentrations. And that is what we see everywhere. Uh, I mean, you all know the literature on that. That's PFAS found on the North Pole and in the blood of uh, newborns, etc. So, uh, and, and, and that is the case we describe very carefully in the risk assessment part. Um, so yes, um, it, uh, based on the persistency and all these other aspects, we see an unacceptable risk to human health and the environment. And that's the reason why I proposed the dossier. Okay, you want to add something there? Well, I would say that actually on the emission side, when you read not only the proposal, but also the hundreds of pages of annexes, uh, the, the emissions are probably better documented compared to the socioeconomic aspects. And this is due to the existence of legislation that is already um, requiring some reporting and tracing of, uh, of the emissions because of the production process being heavily regulated, for example, in Europe. So it's not that the information is totally, uh, totally missing uh, out there. Now, mm -hmm. whether that is a proxy to a risk because of the aspect of um, PFAS being perceived as a non-threshold substance release is equal to risk in that context. Now, obviously, it's up to industry as well to demonstrate that the risk is controlled. And I think that talking about microplastics again, the risk assessment committee in the microplastic proposal accept, uh, had a very actually rational approach to, to the, the release and the risk. And taking the, the amount of uh, microplastics that were actually used in the production, and the industry was supposed to know because we're talking about intentionally added microplastics, but afterwards not measuring necessarily the releases as such, but creating different models for pathways to environment. And because PFAS is also um, an issue of environmental concern, what the industry could do definitely in helping themselves in assessing this, this risk is to uh, perceived during the entire life cycle of the product where the risks of emissions are and what are the pathways to environment. Uh, going back to the microplastic uh, restriction, um, RAC suggested, for example, that some of the, the pathways could be down the drain, so 100% of what is used is uh, actually released. 
But in other uh, cases, they would actually talk about uh, trash disposed products or those where actually the releases are very low simply because of the nature of the product and the use. So uh, estimations could be quite important because in, in the case of uh, trash disposed products, uh, the risk assessment committee back then was using 24% of uh, emission factor and not the 100% otherwise, which would be extremely conservative approach. So this modeling, although it's not purely scientific and not exact, but it does provide some also um, meaningful approaches to industry and to the authorities to assess. Now it's a different story about the production process as such, because as we said, it's heavily regulated. And uh, in some cases you may have closed systems. So some of the um, emissions measurement that are due in the context of other uh, directives in Europe, uh, they can generate that information, provided that you know where the PFAS mm -hmm. are used. Yeah, that's a, that's a challenge. Hey, um, companies could get a derogation if they can assure that they have no PFAS emissions eh, or exposure. How could they prove that they don't have that in their supply chain, uh, including the waste stage? Well, I, I don't think that's the way we approach it. That's not what, what we ask them. It's just uh, what we uh, ask companies still to do in the, in the coming phase, in the during the consultation, is to provide us with more information on users, which we are not already aware of, because there will, will be users. Uh, and, and I think that links very nicely to your T-shirt and also to the statement, no, no, no information, no derogation. We, we approach it actually that uh, for, for those users for which we, are, we don't have any information, they, they are in scope of the restriction. They will be banned after 18 months. So whenever there's a need to step forward, step forward. Uh, so that's important. Uh, whether that leads to a derogation or not, it's a second question. Of course, that depends on the quality of information we will get. Uh, it's not necessarily related to uh, showing whether there are emissions or not. Provide us with the information on uses, specificities, use volumes, tonnages, but also market uh, effects of the ban. And uh, then we can assess in an update of the dossier because we will have to make updates during the process uh, the, the coming year. Uh, of the background document, uh, and also the committees will have to look into that. So I think that's the most important thing. Another dilemma, PFAS imported in articles, uh, Richard, you already mentioned that, from outside the EU. Eh? In um, uh, the REACH regulation, we had the substance of very high concern in articles, where there was the 0.1% weight by weight. Lots of discussion about that. Can we expect something similar here with the 25 uh, parts per billion and the 50 uh, parts per million in articles? Uh, we think the concentration limits we now have defined, based on the information we've got so far, uh, may probably be challenging also when it comes to articles, of course, but not necessarily related to the 0.1%. I think uh, uh, that, one, that discussion was held uh, years ago when there was this uh, court case on the, uh, on the ECHA guidance and the interpretation in initial guidance was changed. And it's now clear that, that, that this should be done, these calculations, on a component basis. So for assembled articles, we should look at the components and the concentration of also the SVHCs in those articles. And I think also for uh, looking at PFAS in articles, you would have to look at the component level. But of course, uh, that uh, substance in articles guidance is about SVHCs. We're not talking about... Uh, 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 yeah, we're now talking about the PFAS restriction, that's a different scope, so it probably needs to be uh, settled also, uh, a, and, and it will probably happen also in the opinion development of uh, the scientific committees to make this very clear. And um, there's the forum uh, on enforcement in Europe, Th uh, they will have a look at the dossier as well, and for, it is for also for them to have a look at this specific question, mm -hmm. to make ex especially clear for articles how to enforce uh, the, the, the concentration limits. Meglena, any last suggestions, maybe some lessons learned? Lessons learned from the other restrictions, surprisingly, uh, the previous restrictions like microplastic, that was a huge exercise of scoping where the, the microplastics are. Surprisingly, industry is still struggling uh, to start the preparation. The key actually advice to industries, well, take those initiatives seriously. Uh, PFAS has been announced already two years ago. Uh, I have the impression that still companies are on the wait and see mood. These restrictions are coming. So the, pre the good preparation, so no information, no derogation, 
This is very much linked to the proper homework, uh, anticipation, although it's difficult when you don't have a clear-cut definition. However, a starting point could be uh, working definitions, even that definition that we have in the proposal could be subject to evolution and change till the restriction is adopted at the end. But uh, work with what we have and uh, be as realistic as possible because this exercise of uh, supply chain surveys and preparation of uh, analysis of alternative socioeconomic analysis are taking months and years to be credible. Okay, thank you both for your suggestions and insights. Uh, the message is clear, no information, no derogation. So companies need to get their act together to avoid an apocalyptic aftershock 18 months after entry into force.